So recently I got a question out of the blue. I was at my church or my temple and one of the religious figures there, one of the sons who knew me very well, looks at me and says, Laksh, three pieces of advice you would give to anyone going into medicine, go. Now normally I would think that question would be a piece of cake. I've been giving advice here on YouTube and other social media platforms for the past almost near decade on how to do better on the medical journey. But being on the spot and only having three pieces of advice I could limit myself to really made me think hard before kind of speaking. But here's what I ultimately told him. Number two is super powerful and as a bonus, I've included a fourth one, so make sure you stay till the end. Number one, delayed gratification has to be a tolerable thing to you. In the medical journey, you just simply can't be obsessed with short-term rewards. Just breaking it down by years, that's usually four years of college, four years of medical school, anywhere from three to seven years of residency. I'm doing even further training and fellowship, which is three years for me, it can be longer for somebody. So you're taking, you know, 11, 12, 13 plus years just to get to day one of being an unsupervised doctor. And even personally speaking, being a year and a half away from being an attending and being an unsupervised cardiologist, I know as an attending, I'm gonna have more obstacles to jump through. And that finish line that I've always been racing towards is almost gonna be feel like somebody's like walking it three or four miles away. And constantly as I get closer, somebody's going to give me a new finish line. Always feels like there's more work left to do. But the years of sacrifice, of studying, of just putting in the hard work is just part of the equation. The second part and the struggle is you have to understand you're going to go through instances where you're gonna see your peers and your friends who have chosen other career paths and other kind of pathways from you moving at different phases and different paces. There are going to be people who have family sooner, who are going to buy houses, who are going to have a job that is going to pay well enough that they're going to be buying cars and vacations. You're going to be there with your med school debt, with your step one exam, your step two exam, and just another exam, another kind of milestone that doesn't feel as celebratory as somebody who's posting on their social media about their, their new child, their new marriage, their new engagement, all the fun places that they're going to see, the fun places that they're eating, you feel like you're just studying and working hard. And that, especially in the social social media world that we live in currently is so tricky to navigate. Even when you tell yourself the sacrifice is going to be worth it, it's hard not paying attention to your high school friends, your college friends who went on other ways, who look like they're living the life that potentially you'd be happy with. And to bring comfort to this piece of advice, personally speaking, you will be able to enjoy all the milestones that truly matter to you. Things like relationships for me in medical school, still having a relationship with my parents, my brother was still something I was able to maintain despite, you know, being away from home, being able to grow a relationship with my partner partner and my now beautiful wife throughout medical school, through residency, and now during fellowship and something that I've been able to do. And growing our family, we've been able to have a beautiful daughter in my first year of fellowship, which has its own challenges. But all of those important milestones that you feel like you may be sacrificing on the medical journey, I promise you, you'll still get to enjoy. Definitely will have to be more disciplined with your time and ability to maneuver all that hecticness that comes through being in medicine. But I've been able to do it and I've been able to enjoy both aspects of my life. But personally speaking, all those milestones that matter to you, you will have the time to devote to them to make sure that they're also parts of your life. You do have to be a little bit more disciplined and creative on making sure that there's still priorities, but it can be done. But the most important part, remember, is that delayed gratification has to be something you're okay with. Now, number two, and I promise that this would be kind of life changing. And I've realized this, especially when I graduated from residency and had my first big boy job as a doctor, where I worked a year as an internal medicine hospitalist. If you want to know what that means or what that life looks like, I'll link down below a playlist or a few videos that we've made here on the YouTube channel. But one of the biggest lessons that I had as a hospitalist is that the further that you go into this journey, the less people will hold you accountable for being just average. And you have to be personally aware that your patients will rely on you to have this personal drive to be even better than that. This is such a big one for me, especially as I transition back into fellowship where life is hectic, expectations are high, but I still see the same patterns. When you're in medical school, for example, there are personal milestones that you hold yourself to. Maybe certain board scores, maybe certain grades, maybe certain GPAs or percentiles compared to your classmates that you are aiming for because you want to be competitive. When you are in residency, you are doing more or less the same thing because a lot of individuals choose to go for further specialties and fellowships, or they may just want a competitive job in a high demanding area. And in those situations, you are always raising the bar for yourself. You never want to be in a situation where you under delivered, under committed to your future self by just slacking off. And so most of us in those situations, when I was in medical school and residency, you just work your ass off. And it is a normal process because you never want to be in a situation, be told no, that an opportunity is not available to you because you didn't work hard enough. But 
after that, like when you're a true physician, when you are working independently, there's no one holding your hand or comparing you to some benchmark compared to your colleagues. Rarely since something that's at least motivating enough for you to say, I need to still get better. And I realized that when I was a hospitalist is that I could see the difference in the work ethic that I came into being somebody who wanted to be a great brand new doctor and somebody who had been working 20 years and the gap wasn't as big as I expected. Thinking that somebody who had 20 more years of experience to me that probably be 20 times the physician that I was, I realized that at some point that those individuals had found a level, a status quo, a version of average for themselves that they were okay with. They were getting by with that. And I saw that that was leading to patients not getting the best care. Medicine is always growing. And with that, you as a physician, you as a provider, you as a future caretaker have to constantly be growing too. But again, the further you go into this journey, the less somebody is holding you accountable for that benchmark. And even in fellowship, again, I see that same pattern is that everyone is expecting us to be a grown up. Everyone Everyone wants us to be a great cardiologist, but no one is going to hold my hand and saying, you are not at this point that you should be. People in fellowship are going to constantly ask me questions. And if I feel like I don't know an answer, they may think that that's just a lapse in my understanding. But if it becomes a pattern, I'm the only one that's really aware, like Lux, you're not as good as in cardiology as you should be for being a second year fellow. And so just understand that the further you go into this journey, the status quo is going to be a lot lower than you're expecting. People are going to be surprisingly okay with a level of effort, a level of consistency and a lack of progress and you can float there as well and you will coast and you will likely get by for the rest of your career or you can understand that there are patients that we take care of there are families that depend on our abilities to understand to improve to progress that is dependent on your ability to say you know what i should learn more about these areas that i'm weak at i see patients that have these problems all the time but i know that in these two areas i'm not good enough just using cardiology as an example if i feel like i'm looking at an ekg and i can't confidently say all the time what it's showing or not maybe I need to improve on EKG. So if I'm looking at an echo or an image for a patient on a stress test and I don't feel comfortable enough on which way I'm going to call it, I need to get better at those. If I'm doing a clinical exam on a patient and I feel like that's not a skill I've developed quite enough, I need to improve. Because again, there's going to be a patient that is going to depend on my level of average. And if I have set the bar where everyone else is setting it for me, then those patients unfortunately just get crappy care. And so you, as somebody going into medicine, ideally for the right reasons, have to constantly raise the bar for yourself. Because the further you go, the less of an expectation, the less of a threshold that you have to reach to be impressive. And that's like just plain truth. So hopefully that hits home. Always kind of be your own main internal driver of progress because the board scores and the grades and everything will kind of fade away. And the only people that are going to depend on how good you are are the patients you ultimately take care of. And as a closing thought, I want to share something that I wrote down while reflecting on this is that you have to be a big believer that you don't want your patients to be unlucky to have you as an assigned doctor. Thus, you can't can't be okay with good enough. Now, before we get back to the rest of the episode, let's quickly talk about today's sponsor, which is Picmonic. If you're on your medical journey and you haven't had much luck finding an all in one resource that can help you learn the material that you need for your classes, your rotations, as well as help you quiz and test to build that long term retention, the Picmonic may be exactly the resource you've been looking for. And one of the most unique aspects about Picmonic has to be their story based videos, which combine these fun, memorable, and silly images to help you remember specific features of a disease or a treatment. And when I say videos, I mean tons of them with endless play playlist that you can sort based on the class you're currently taking, the board exams you may be prepping for, even the board resource you're learning from, such as first aid for step one, or even the rotation that you want to honor. In addition, they have very simple and effective ways to quiz yourself, such as their daily quiz feature, which allows you to continue to stay sharp on your past topics that you've learned to make sure you achieve mastery, plus so much more. So once again, if you're on your medical journey and you haven't had much luck finding that all-in-one resource that can help you learn and master medicine to make the entire journey a lot less stressful, then Picmonic may be a great resource for you. So if you're interested in learning more, there'll be a link down below in the description. And our friends at Picmonic have also been nice enough to include an extra 15% off for our audience members for those of you that want to give them a shot. So if you want more information or want to get started with Picmonic, click that link down below in the description. And of course, thank you to Picmonic for being today's sponsor. Now, advice number three is that the reasons you go into medicine are likely going to be different than the reasons that you choose to stay. Now, most of us that go into the field of medicine, particularly to be a physician, usually write a personal statement that looks something like, I want to go into the field to be a doctor to serve and help people. And that is always going to be the core, ideally, why most people do what they do to be a physician. But in that fundamental concept, often we also have this clouded perception of what our life as a physician is going to look like. We often think that we're going to be saving the lives of every patient that we're going to encounter 
encounter. And there are specialties that definitely do that, right? If you're a trauma surgeon, if you're a surgeon that is going to be doing life-saving surgery and a patient comes in, if you're an interventional cardiologist that are putting stents and somebody have a heart attack that's otherwise going to pass away or have a really severe outcome, like those are definitely encounters of people doing life-saving procedures. And in addition, there are going to be patients that you see that you feel like you can do nothing for. I may have somebody who comes to me with an EKG finding that their doctor thought was really concerning. Patient doesn't seem to be overly concerned. And I look at it and saying, this is a normal variant, or I'm not too concerned about what I see here. You can go back to your primary care doctor. Like there are visits that you have during your day to day where you're using your skills to give some guidance, both to other fields and doctors, but also to your patients, but it's really not life changing. And then we definitely have to talk about the time that you don't spend with patients that still take a good chunk of your time. When I was a hospitalist, for example, I was spending maybe two to three to three and a half, four hours at tops, actually at the patient's bedside throughout the day. The rest of the time was putting in orders, calling consultants, writing all the notes, history and physical notes, discharge summaries, coordinating with pharmacies, social workers, everything that has to happen behind the scenes for a patient to get better care. But that's not the vision that I was thinking of when I was going into medicine. I didn't write a personal statement about all the beautiful notes that I was going to write, all the discharge summaries, all the pharmacy requests or prior authorizations you have to fill out, all the paperwork if somebody needs leave or disability. Like those are not things that people talk about going into medicine, but still take a good chunk of your time. And there are very few specialties where you just go from procedure to procedure or patient care to patient care. There is usually a level of admin and this probably doesn't fit within my field of description I was considering, but I still do it anyways, kind of role. And that reality can be pretty striking for a lot of individuals who write this beautiful personal statement of saying, this is why I want to go into medicine. But in reality, no one stops them and says, this is beautiful, but your life in medicine is probably not going to look like this 100%. So as you go through the journey, you're going to have to constantly find new reasons to enjoy the field. This is a concept that I personally call your golden nuggets. These are experiences that you have with patients, with colleagues, with peers that stick with you and saying, man, that is an example of a reason why I love doing this. And I'm going to keep that in my back pocket because there's going to be a time, 100%, that you're going to be demotivated, probably more than once, where you're going to be like, why in the hell am I doing this? Why am I putting myself through all this gauntlet or my peers who have gone into finance and business and investing and other forms and engineering, have a stable job, work from home. And here I am kind of drugging myself into the hospital at like 6 or 7 a.m. And every time you have those episodes, you can think about your golden nuggets and you can think about, okay, the last time that I had this beautiful interaction with this patient that really made the day worth it. I did X, Y, and Z to get that rapport with that patient, to get that result for that patient. Are these next patients that I'm going to see today worth the effort to potentially have another golden nugget? And usually the answer is yes. And you can extrapolate this to every experience you have in the medical journey of storing more and more golden nuggets through all the pillars that are important to you, because you're going to have those times that are going to not be as exciting, that are not going to be as motivating. And those golden nuggets are going to then stack up on themselves and serve as new reasons of why you love the field. I just like everyone else went into the field to help people, but I realized that's not enough. As I've gone through and stored more golden nuggets, I realized that I enjoy both pattern recognition and I also enjoy using what I think to be a calm demeanor to be able to explain things in a very simple sense to patients, nurses, other specialists, and really just make everyone feel like I'm glad this guy's on my side. I like being in that role and being a cardiologist is really nice because I get to serve in a very complex field of cardiology and very complex field of medicine and being able to give that guidance to patients and specialists and nurses and whoever may need it, but doing so in a calm demeanor while fundamentally helping people. So I get to use my years of experience to help and guide people and patients and make everyone feel like, you know, we're heading in the right direction. And so that's just an example of a new reason that I discovered of why I love the job that I do. A lot different than what I wrote in my personal statement, but I still enjoy what I'm doing. And you have to constantly find those things as you go through your journey, because you're going to likely lose track of what you ultimately wrote your personal statement for. But ideally, you're keeping track of other golden nuggets that keep the job worth it. And the final one that I said was a bonus. This was not one I included in the initial three, but I think as I've pondered on this question more is just as important. So number four is don't perceive your reflections based on the talents of others. In medicine, you are constantly feeling like an imposter. You're always wondering how you tricked so many people to thinking that you're smart enough, good enough, etc., to be a future caretaker, to be a provider. And I had the same feelings early on in medical school and then in residency and then again as an attending and again as a fellow. And 
never ends, it'll never go away. But one thing that I realized is that often the reflection of the person that we're always looking at is somehow shaped by all the strengths of people that we admire. Maybe you see Sally in your medical school class just crush it with how she does in the exams. And so your reflection of yourself is compared to how well she's doing. So when you look at yourself, it's like, ah, I'm so, it's such a dummy. Can't barely get C's or B's in my exam. And here Sally's just crushing in every exam with A's and just looks like she's barely trying. You may see individuals on your rotations that are just like so good at interacting with patients, presenting patients, diagnosing things, and just answering questions when the attending is. So when you look at your personal reflection, you're like, man, like speak up, like just say things with confidence. Like, why don't you know these things off the bat? Just like these individuals, like, you need to work harder. You need to be smarter. And that feeling constantly stays there where you're always using your reflection and is often just a mold of all the people you admire that you wish you had the characteristics they do. And we do this in our personal lives too, but in medicine it's just like tenfold. And you have to be okay with your reflection really just being who you are. And one quote that's really stuck with me is that you can't change your reflection by shaking the mirror. You either have to change your perception of how you treat yourself, how you improve. And so on the flip side, if you're looking at other people as kind of a standard of how you perceive yourself, you're always going to be not quite up to your measure. As another example, we may see somebody who is so good at answering questions. They're super confident every time they do it. And even if they're not right, they're just ready to give an answer. Let's try to be a little bit more like them the next time we're asked something from our attendings. This colleague of mine is so good about self-improving, about reading more about the field of medicine. So they always just look like they're becoming a better doctor. I need to be a little bit more like them. I can't commit to the level and intensity that they may do, but maybe like these time slots or these methods, I can improve on how I improve as a clinician. And that is how you flip that. Your reflection of yourself is still you. You're using others as a motivation to enhance what you see. You're never using them as a standard of how you perceive yourself. And again, the field is 11, 13 years long. And if you constantly go into this trap of looking at other people as a reflection of where you're not, you are constantly going to feel underwhelming. And thankfully, being able to break out of that spell early in my journey has helped me excel for the latter half because I'm constantly using others as inspiration inspiration versus comparison. So just remember, don't use the strength of others to serve as a reflection that you see of yourself. But those are my biggest piece of advice that I would give to anybody going into medicine. If you guys enjoyed this episode, if you enjoyed these pieces of advice, let me know in the comment section. If you found this video to be helpful, I'd be super thankful and appreciative if you hit that like button on the YouTube channel, notification bell, subscribe if you are considering wanting more tips and tricks to help you succeed on your medical journey, doing it with less stress. And if you enjoyed these episodes, there are tons of links down below of all the free resources resources that I've made over my past nearly decade helping others on the medical journey, including how I studied, how I got the grades that I wanted, my favorite resource to study better in medical school, which I'll link down below, as well as some of our other programs that we have here at the MD Journey, including our Med School Blueprint. And if you're interested in working with us one-on-one -on -one to improve your grades in just a few short weeks, I'll link that down below with all the reviews and testimonials we have as well. But if you're interested in none of that, all I want to say is, first of all, thank you for making it to the end of the video. I hope you drop a comment so I can interact with you and learn what questions and piece of advice you guys want for future videos. But if you enjoyed this video, you'll probably also enjoy this video right here of all the pieces of advice I'd give to anybody that is in medical school. And as always, my friends, thank you. Thank you so much for being a part of my journey. Hopefully I was a little help to you guys on yours. I'll catch you guys in the next one. Peace.